We, we've been uh, in a series these past few weeks, uh, like we do every year. We, we've kind of had this parallel uh, course uh, over the past few weeks. We've been talking about go and grow, uh, right? We, uh, this, is, this is something that's been underway, been in planning since the late summer. Uh, we, we started uh, with a teaching series about that in November, uh, and then we've had several information sessions and online Zoom and things here. We've had lots of people check in. Great, great conversations. Uh, lots of good things going on there. But at, at the parallel time, we've, we also have been doing a series on Christmas. These things are not disconnected. Uh, and, and this series this year uh, is a focus on the angelic visits of Christmas. So it's, it's important, I think, at this time of year for us to do the work of belief and, and to do everything we can to resist the cultural or social or even traditional drawings to spend the Christmas season thinking about anything other than the birth of Christ, right? And so that's normal for us. We, we want to focus on that. And, and this year, we've, we, we've, we've taken a special look at how God has spared no resource in, in bringing this Christmas reality to us. The, the birth of Christ, this miraculous thing that happened a couple of thousand years ago, the story that maybe for some of us has become very familiar and that we might miss the power of what happened there. Uh, and so we've, we've looked at how God, he, he mobilized his angelic, he mobilized his warriors, he mobilized his messengers to help lead and guide the very ordinary people that, that, are, that, are, that are essential uh, to this Christmas story. And so each week we've looked at those angelic interventions uh, and we're looking at not just the supernatural side of what happened, but we're really spending all, even more time reflecting on the very ordinary people that were on the other side, that were the audience of that angel. And so we talked uh, that first week about Zechariah and how the angel Gabriel came and, and, and told them about this miraculous birth, who we know to be John the Baptist, this miraculous conception uh, of an older couple that uh, had long since likely given up on the idea of having an heir and miraculously had conceived and went on to be John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, the one who was the actual forerunner to Jesus. And last week we looked at Mary, this young teenage girl uh, who was visited by the angel to give her a scandalous reality is that you're about to become pregnant, not by the man you're engaged to, but by the Holy Spirit. And now you get to go tell your family that, right? And so uh, I think it was helpful that it was the angel that was preparing her for that. And we see that Mary's response, unlike Zacharias, was one of a, a song of faith, a song of where, where she mimicked and, and paralleled the song of Hannah and thanking God, glorifying God for the opportunity to serve him in the way, certainly not uh, understanding of fully what she was in for, but knowing that if it's from God, it's good, right? And so we, we saw that in opposition to Zechariah's response, who asked for proof, right? He, he wanted evidence beyond it. And so we see the very ordinary. And today we're going we're gonna to continue on uh, this pathway of these angelic interventions. And we're going to talk about Joseph. We're going to talk about Joseph, the, the adopted father of Jesus. And we're actually going to switch over to the book of Matthew. We've been studying in the the book of Luke for the past two weeks. Luke, I think, does a tremendous job of telling the Christmas stories. We call the first four books of the, uh, the New Testament uh, the Gospels. Uh, they Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all focus and tell the story of Jesus by those five, four men we're talking about. They tell some of the stories between all of them. Some of them tell just some stories. They all start in different places. Luke does the best job, I think, of telling the story. You really get the imagery, and Luke is uniquely able to do that. Uh, but Luke doesn't mention what I'm going to talk about today. Luke starts out with Zachariah. He jumps to Mary. He goes on then to talk about what we're going to talk on Christmas Eve, the birth of Jesus, actually in Bethlehem. But we have to use Matthew's account for today's. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna jump to the book of Matthew, and we're going we're gonna to see something that I think is helpful for us to think about when we think about contrasting the book of Luke and the book of Matthew, and that they both, again, tell the story of Jesus, but from different perspectives by different men with different emphasis. If you remember, we started out this year with a, a series on the book of Matthew, and we, we didn't finish it because COVID, uh, but we got a pretty good start on it. And if you remember, we, we talked about what Matthew, his, his focus was, is that Matthew's intent, what you see throughout the book of Matthew, was he really wanted to, to get to, he really wanted to speak to the Jewish audience. So in Matthew 1, we see he, he spent a lot of time and effort going through the genealogy of 
of Jesus. He ties Jesus to David and him beyond that. And so for the Jew to hear the story of this Messiah, it was important for him to hear that. Luke was not a Jew, and so the story of Luke tended to be more towards a, a Gentile audience. I think when we look at passages like this, it's helpful for us to do that, to consider what we call the context, right? And, and just, a, just a real quick side note. We, we have a, a, a deep commitment to, to helping all of us understand and live out God's word. And I think if you ask people about the village church and how they would describe us, certainly at the top of those few adjectives, they're going to talk about how missional we are, that we're a church that is focused on showing the love of Christ in word and in deed, serving our community, celebrate recovery, Joshua's place, uh, uh, working in Guatemala, internationally, all of these focuses about us being on mission, and that's good. But I think you should also know about it, as if you don't, and many do, is that we are laser-focused on discipleship. We believe in, in bringing the good news, inviting people into the kingdom, and telling them about a faith that works on the problems that they have in their life, and preparing them for this thing that was called the way. Call it, calling them to this better life of following Jesus in a deep and committed way. And the anchoring of that, honestly, is God's word. We believe in the eternal and the ancient truth that's given in his word. Now, it's my belief, and I know probably for some of you, that generally Christians today don't do a good job of using God's word to, to empower their life. I don't mean using God's word to, to be more moral. I don't mean using God's word to, to be more habitual in their Christian experiences. I'm talking about freedom and power that comes from God's word. And that's why we are so committed to helping all of us do something that I think is so beyond the American church in some ways, and that is really using Scripture in the way that it was intended. It's a difficult book, right? This is not a book like any other book. It's not written by just one person chronologically with just one idea. There's one bigger idea, God's love and pursuit of each of us. But it's written by several people over thousands of years in different languages and a canonized Scripture that we study, the 66 different books... And so it's a little hard. And so one of my New Year's challenges for all of us is that if we're not involved in our, our, our Sunday morning Bible study, one, if you weren't there this morning, you missed it. Daryl, we thought he'd lost his voice yelling at the Ohio State game yesterday. He found a whole new gear this morning as we wrapped up the book of Hebrews. We've studied the book of Leviticus and the book of Hebrews this year. Um, but now is a great time to jump in because in our Bible study, what the intent is we're not studying the Bible to tell you what to think. We're not studying God's word to tell you to believe like us. We want to equip you to use God's word as a tool, the sword of truth, that helps us live this way in a way that's very relevant today, but it ain't easy. So you're going to need some tools in your tool belt to do that. And I really, I'm, I know I'm going on long here, but I really want you to engage the benefit of what we have here on Sunday mornings at 9.30 on Bible study. And I'm really excited to tell you that starting on January 3rd, we're going to start into a whole new book. One of my favorite, I say that about every book, I know. One of my favorite, uh, we're going to study the book of Acts. And, and we're going to walk through the early church. This is so important for us. I think it's, it's critical for us as Christians to understand the history and connection we have with the church. This thing that we're doing here this morning, it ties us back to the first century, that we are primarily loving God, loving others, making disciples. That's been the mission of the church for a couple thousand years, and we're going to see how that church started, where it headed, all the things that are part of the book of Acts, again, told by Luke, the same person who wrote Luke, and we're not going to just hear the story. We're going to help us understand how we understand the scriptures, how we read and contextualize it. So there's my commercial, my side note there. Uh, if you've not been in Bible study, January 3rd will be a great time to jump in. It's a great place to jump in and start with a whole new uh, book and a whole new year and a whole new focus on letting God's word be relevant in our life. So today we're in Matthew, and we're going we're gonna to hear from Matthew, tell the story of Joseph. And, and again, I, I want us to hear this story through the lens of seeing Joseph as that very ordinary person that we're going to see found here in verse 18. So follow along with me. If you've got your Bible, your Bible apps. Chapter 1, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant 
through the Holy Spirit. Don't miss how significant that is. Engagement, again, remember, engagement in that time was not just about a verbal commitment. It was a legal binding relationship. To break an engagement was to be divorced. There was, there was no sexual intercourse that had happened yet, but there was a commitment in just about every other way. It was a big deal to be committed to marriage. Verse 19, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet, not, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So we see the humanness of Joseph, the, the reasonable response that Joseph would have had and, and again, we're thinking Mary was a teenager, 13, 14, 15. We're not sure. Joseph, likely under 20 himself, was a teenage boy, probably himself, committed publicly to this woman. And at some, we don't know how far the news had gotten, but the news was getting there that the woman he's engaged to was pregnant and not by him, which would have been its own problem, but by somebody else. And she's making claims that it was God, <laughs> right? And so we see that Joseph is a righteous man. He's a devout man. That the scripture allowed, the law allowed for divorce. The law also allowed for punishment by death. That if, if in fact, that it was proven that she was adulterous, that, that a, a reasonable and a, a provable, if it was proven, response could be that they could stone Mary. Joseph said, I don't think that's the right response to this. He obviously loved Mary. But he didn't want to add shame to what shame was probably already there. And so his intent at that point was, I'm going to divorce her. I'm not going to fall all the way through and ask that she be killed. I'm just going to do it quietly, and then we'll go our separate ways, is my assumption of what was in his mind at that time. I think we can all agree that was a pretty reasonable and, thank, frankly, kind of a merciful response to what he had just been through. Verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, pause there. Just, it's a note. I don't know that it's all that significant in terms of how the story goes, but recall here that for Zechariah and for Mary, the angel Gabriel visited them in person. The angel was there. We're going to see when the angel visits the shepherds and the, and the course that comes along with it, it was a live visit. This is a dream. I don't want us to be discouraged by that because we're actually going to see that while Joseph did not get a live appearance, <laughs> he actually gets four interventions from the divine. He gets four interventions from God's messengers that we'll talk about. What did he say in the dream? Joseph, son of David. You pick up on that. Again, there's those nuances, I think, that our scripture are so helpful that he opens up by saying, Jesus the Messiah, something a Jew wants to hear. He talks about Joseph being the son of David, something a Jew wants to hear. These are intentional things that are helpful for us to understand the writer and the audience at the time. Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he, and he gave them the name Jesus. So, so we see in this short passage here, this very difficult transition that Joseph went through. One of embarrassed and shamed fiance to someone who, because the angel of the Lord visited him in the dream, said, you know what, I'm going to do something that's counterintuitive, countercultural. I'm actually going to take her on as my wife. And he had the benefit of the Lord's intervention. Had the Lord not intervened, we probably could assume that Joseph would have done the thing that would have been reasonable. And then he takes Mary in, and we know he then becomes the adopted father of Jesus himself. So what, what do we know about this person, Joseph? Well, what we see in Joseph's life that, that throughout uh, his, his, the, the short history that we see in Scripture, and just so you know, we, we don't see Joseph at the adult life of Jesus. The last time we see Joseph is in, uh, uh, when Jesus is, is 12 years old and Joseph was, uh, because he was devout, because he was a good Jew, it was, it was a customary for them to take his family to the, uh, to the temple, to Jerusalem for the, for the Passover feast every year. So they take Jesus there. They, he's hanging out with some smart guys in the temple and then they forget him. They leave him. <laughs> and that's the last we hear about Joseph. The, the scriptures seem to indicate in Jesus' adult life through some conversations we see Jesus having hanging on the cross with his best friend John and the fact that the scriptures are silent about Joseph, it's largely presumed that Joseph died. 
somewhere after what we see when he was 12 years old to where uh, Jesus is actually his, his adult ministry. But in the time we see Joseph, we see a man who is very much a part of this Christmas story that you and I celebrate this morning. Well, what, what happens after this section here we see in Matthew is that Caesar, who was the emperor of Rome, who, over, who was, over, was ruling over Israel at the time, calls for a census. And so what would happen then is wherever your, ancestors, wherever your ancestors are from, you have to go to that place. For Joseph, he was in Galilee, he was in Nazareth, but he had to go to Bethlehem. Well, Bethlehem is about 90 miles south, right? About eight miles from Jerusalem. And so there was no waiver given because your wife is pregnant, right? So Joseph has to pack up his pregnant wife and they have to head south to Bethlehem and a very familiar story to us. And we know they show up in Bethlehem and Jesus is born into a condition where he was, there was not room for him. And in fact, he was born in a place where they feed animals. And so we see this is not a great life. It's not a great start for Joseph and Mary. And that had he chosen the next steps, he certainly would have not have picked up his pregnant wife and headed 90 miles south on what was likely a walk for several days to get to Bethlehem. We see Joseph's devoutness, and eight days later, he takes Jesus to be given a name and to be circumcised. We see after the awaited period, after 40 days, he takes him to the temple, and they actually then sacrifice either two pigeons or two doves, that, that he's then prophesied by Simeon and Anna. So we see these miraculous prophecies over Jesus. But we see in that Joseph doing his paternal responsibilities. He's a good man. He's a man who follows the law. And of course, again, we see that he follows that law even up to where Jesus, we see him when he's 12 years old. And not long after they're in Bethlehem, we know the story of the Magi who come looking for Jesus. They've seen the star. They've heard the prophecies. They go and visit Herod, who's the king. And they tell him, we want to meet this Jesus. We've heard about him. We hear he's going to be the king of kings. <laughs> well, that's a threat to Herod, of course. So Herod doesn't like it. And so he deceives the Magi and says, hey, when you find him, come back and tell me. Of course, they know that Herod's got, uh, he's got bad intentions there. He actually wants to kill Jesus. And so they go then to find Jesus. And it's that second intervention we see where while they're there, that the angel visits Joseph and warns them, Herod's going to kill Jesus. You need to go to Egypt. So we see the second intervention. And so Joseph and Mary pick up and they head to Egypt. And they're there in Egypt for a while. And an angel comes and says, hey, Herod's dead. It's time to go back. But we see then after that third intervention that they're heading back and what we presume to be heading back towards Judea around Bethlehem, where they had started out, where his ancestors are from. And then he receives another warning that says, don't go back there because while Herod is dead, his son, who was just as evil as Herod, is ruling over Judea. And so at that point, they decided to go back to Nazareth. And so we see this journey of Nazareth to Nazareth over probably two, three, four years. We don't know. And throughout the early life of Jesus, we see Joseph, this good and humble dad, facing death. It's, it's likely that, that Herod would not have been satisfied with just killing Jesus. He would have certainly take action against his family too. And we see this young couple on the run as they go from Nazareth to Bethlehem to Jerusalem to Egypt and then back to Nazareth again. So we see an eventful life in this, this person, Joseph. But today I want us to think about the, the general characteristics of, a, of Joseph that I think all of these stories tell us about him that honestly, I think are very helpful for me. As I studied Joseph this week, and I, I really, when, you know, I, I try not to make myself the point of every character that I read about, but I think when I do read scriptures, it's very helpful as we remind ourselves that these were just regular folks that God had used to put myself in that place and say, how would I have handled that? Would I have been as faithful? Would I have been as humble? Would I have then responded in the way that Joseph did? And I think that we see really two big things in Joseph character, in Joseph personality that are helpful to see about him and that frankly are helpful for us to think about ourselves. The first thing is, is that I think that we see if Joseph is a man of obedience. Joseph is a man of obedience. Now, some of the evidence point towards his commitment to the law, which would have been his means of salvation prior to the new covenant. And so we don't fault him for following the law. He was under the law. And so we see as a father that he has taken on these roles of adopted father and that he had raised Jesus and the ways and customs of God would have had him to raise him. And so he was obedient to that. But he was also obedient to the move of God. When the angel jumped in, when he had these dreams, he would change course. He was obedient to the calling of what was being asked of him. Obviously, the outcomes of those were much better because he listened and so I think for that reason, it's important for us to think about obedience in our own life. 
I, I, you know, maybe I'm alone here. I, I don't even like the word. <laughs> I don't even like to say obedience. I mean, I, I'm like, I'm assuming most of you, there's this human nature that at its core is self-centered. It, it's self-preserving. It's even rebellious at times. And so when we start talking about words like obedience, it begins to push against the very nature of who I am. And so as I think about someone's attribute that I would admire and say that's an admirable characteristic, and then I then begin to presume that that's a characteristic that I should take on, then i got to think, well, that's going to be a little bit troubling because I'll be honest, you can ask Nona, there's evidence to support in my life that I'm not an obedient person. <laughs> there's lots of sins that I've had to repent of in my walk with Jesus. Why is that? Well, because I'm human, right? But I'm also American, right? We love this rugged individualism, right? We, we, we love the entitlements of our citizenship. We love to set out on our own course. We love to strike out in our way. We won't be ruled by the king of England or anybody, right? Unless I agree with them. But this idea of obedience, it, it rubs against us. And it rubs against us, again, because we're, we're human, but it also rubs against us because we've elevated this idea beyond what I think is healthy. And as it relates to us being a follower of Jesus, it makes it sometimes difficult because of the three C's. We talked about it in a Bible study this morning. Well, what are the three C's? You, you should be able to repeat them after me, right? Comfort, convenience, control. And inside of me, the battle towards obedience, it, it strikes firstly against comfort. Because comfort for me is about security, right? It's about predictability. I don't want any surprises. I don't, I don't want to be challenged, right? The convenience for me isn't just about things being easy, but sometimes it's about the path of least resistance. It's about me going from A to B in the quickest way and, and deciding that that's the best way because it was quicker. But in fact, I figured out that following the Lord sometimes isn't all that convenient. And the hardest one, control, right? <laughs> because I want things God's way so long as it's my way, right? That for me to give that up, that, that gets us into the three S's. Oh no, he's bringing it up again. <laughs> the three S's, why? Because the toughest S for me of all the S's is surrender. Giving up my will in favor of anybody else's will, but including God, it's a very difficult thing for me. So when I look at Joseph and see that he's a man of obedience, and then I presume, based on how the scripture would communicate truth to me, that what I know that Jesus says that, you know, to follow me is to pick up your cross, right? That you're to come and die. That, that kind of obedience is a difficult thing for me, but I know it's the pathway of followership. The second thing I see in the life of Joseph beyond his obedience is that Joseph is a, a man of action. Joseph was, 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 was a man that moved. And, and for me, I, I, I like that. <laughs> when the angel said move, and, and these weren't small moves, all right? This is pick, pick up your pregnant wife, walk 90 miles with her pregnant to Bethlehem. And obviously, you know, he, he had not been on any of the, the good websites to get a good hotel room because when he got there, he wasn't ready, right? But despite that, he continued to be obedient. And when the angel said, go to Egypt, he went to Egypt. When the angel said, go back, he went back. He was a man of action. And, and, and I, I like that ab about Joseph because I think that for me, and I, you know, you don't have to spend much time around here to find out that this is a church of activists. That many of you are here because you are activists. I, I love that about who we are. I love that we're a church that talks about delivering the, the gospel on both just word and deed. We talk about a faith that works. We, we, we talk about love as a verb. We say talk is cheap. I, I love that's who we are as a church because I think that allows us to punch way outside of our weight class in the spiritual realm. And it certainly allows for us to have the kind of impact that we've had over the years because many of you have chosen to go against the way of comfort to go against the way of convenience, you've chosen the more difficult path because you believe that God has a purpose for you. And that purpose means motion. It means movement. However, and sometimes 
the hardest thing to do is nothing at all. I'm trying to make eye contact with all my activist friends here. <laughs> the hardest thing to do was nothing at all. Guilty, right? Why? Joseph was faced with a, a shameful, embarrassing scandal that would affect both him and the woman that he presumed, presumed he loved. And so he, was, he had an action that he was ready to move into. We know, we find out he's a man of action. And so divorcing her in a quiet way would have been the right thing that have, would have solved the problem in that moment. But the angel of the Lord said, no, I'm calling you to inaction. I'm calling you to nothing. I'm calling you to patience. Now, we know that not doing anything is not nothing, right? And so for us activists... That are, that are here this morning, I, I want to also think about that as we think about what it means for us to serve the Lord. For those of you, when Drew's announced that we're going to take Sunday off, you had that like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean we're taking a Sunday off? There's people dying going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that we're a church of activists, but I think one of the things that I have to do on a regular basis is that I have to remind us all and I know this isn't news to all of you activists, God's sovereign. God's, God's sovereign. He's in control. That, that he invites us into his plan. He calls us to action. There are things that he's calling us to as a church. There's things he's calling, to, he's calling you to as individuals to get off of the sidelines or, or to get into the game in a different way. Those are all things that's exactly what the Lord does. But I think we've also got to be prepared to just be patient and wait on the Lord. And I know, especially, I think, for, for many of us that are in a season of healing, where we've really faced some very difficult things, and if you have that more activistic way of doing things, that you can think of all kinds of creative ways to get yourself out of that difficulty, but maybe the Lord's just saying, wait. Just, just be patient. I, I'll be honest with you, this is not scripture, but just experience. I've made very few mistakes by not doing something. For me personally, I'm not, I'm not, I know that's not true for everybody. There are people here that, that, that need to not be so passive. But for me personally, that I do much better to whatever my first thought of action is to wait and pray about it a little bit longer. And I've seen in my life where the Lord has unstrung me in a way that I would have moved had I had the ability, but he took me to the point where I didn't even have the ability to do what he was calling me to do because he wanted to do something in me at that time. And so I think... Uh, a lesson that I'd like for all of us to consider this morning about Joseph is about his obedience, about his call to action, but, but a special little note for the village people. <laughs> this is really important because we're talking about a new vision. Not new like different. We're talking new bigger. We're talking about a bigger impact on this community. We're talking about taking on more risk. And I want you to filter that decision about where your place is in that new vision, not through a place of obligation or guilt or even need, but, but that you would spend time reflecting about your place in that vision, about what God is uniquely saying to you. Well, what is your purpose? What, what, is, what is God doing in you? What do you see in your time of difficulty and abundance that God has been preparing you for in all those movements, whether it's to stay and wait or whether it's to move and go forward, all of it requires faith, right? But I, I want us to, to, to really struggle with that this morning. The, the commitment I made when we started this Go and Grow campaign is that is it wouldn't get weird. And what do I mean by that is that today is Commitment Sunday, and so this is that we're going to take a, a we're, we're going to take a, a collection of pledges. We're going to ask people to commit to giving, either at once today or over the next twelve months. But what we want to do is for you to engage that plan from a place of obedience, if God is speaking to you, and willingness. Because I think when those two things come together, when I am sufficiently challenged, where I'm, where I'm moved to a place of sacrifice, but not because I feel manipulated or I'm looking for credit or because it's ego, but that I'm humbly listening to what the Lord is saying to me, then I believe that's where God finds his favor on my life. 
And what I'm saying to you this morning, as I'm getting ready to walk you through this process of us pledging to this, that I've talked about Joseph's obedience and I've talked about Joseph's activism, but that does not mean that every one of you should fill out a pledge card. I'm not even saying what that pledge card ought to look like. I'm saying that's between you and the Lord, that I and the elders of this church have decided that God will decide what happens. We're going to only respond to what he does through you in this time and what doors he opens up, but we're not worried. We're not anxious. There really is no fear in my heart this morning as I talk about this. So I I want you to think about that this morning. I know many of you have already gone through the process. We've had several that have already given those pledges. But today is Commitment Sunday. Today is the day we set out as the time that we're going to, as a church, using Drew's imagery there, we're going to link arms. We're we're going to take a stance. We're going to say, Lord, we hear you, we're listening, and we're going to move into the direction that you're calling us to. And we're going to do this at an individual family level, but we're going to link together as a church and to fulfill that mission for what you have for us in this coming year. So, Dan, why don't you head up? So these next few minutes, we're going to do something here we don't do very often. I think we've, we've done it once in the seven or eight years we've been at church here. Um, and that is we're going we're gonna to stop and we're just going to pause and reflect uh, about what that looks like. We're going to pray for 2021. And for those that are, want to participate in this Go and Grow campaign, um, Ed, can you throw that uh, pledge card up there? Just the real functional side of this. Um, just if you want to participate financially, we're, we're asking that it be a 12-month pledge, or you can give all at once. Some would want the tax benefit, and that's great to take it all at once. Um, that benefits the plan because we've, we've already started. We've already been tearing out things in the gym. Walls are going up. Equipment's been ordered. So the move we're about to make is already underway. But we have flexibility written into the plan. Uh, and so um, just let us know who you are, what that pledge is, um, how you'd like to pay it. It's very flexible. If you don't make the pledge, we're not going to come looking for you and take away your car, or your children, or yeah, some of you might want that. We're not going to do that either. But we don't, we don't want you to make this, uh, this commitment out of compulsion. We want you to think about it. We want you to pray about it. So uh, Kyle's going to just sing a little bit here for a minute. And, and I just want us to, I'm going to pray. Uh, and if you've, if you've got your pledge, if you've not done it, go ahead and pull it out. You can be filling it out now. Here in a minute, I'm going to tell you about how we're going to bring that up. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father. Lord, we are so grateful. We are so grateful for your word that leads and directs us and shows us the character of who you are. God, that I'm, I'm painfully aware that sometimes um, my resistance to obedience, my resistance to action, Lord, I just have to be honest, sometimes I doubt your goodness. I doubt your sovereignty. Lord, in those places where I doubt you, I, I try to take the reins or I'm willing or less willing to take risk. Lord, if I doubt that you're good, then I wonder about your mercy and your grace and your ability to come through for me when I step out and take a chance. But God, this morning, I, I'm asking that your Holy Spirit would, would reveal that to all of us, that we would see in you the, the, the goodness of who you are. And God, it's from that place and, and that place of goodness that we would, we would reflect we, we would know. <laughs> God, it's from that goodness that you draw us into a place of obedience. And so, God, I, I ask for that this morning. And, Lord, as we head into communion uh, and we take of the elements, uh, the, and remember the blood and the, the body uh, that was broken for us, the blood that was shed, Lord, that we also worship you in that place, that we realize that whatever work needs to be done has already been done, that it is finished. And Jesus, you have finished it all. It's in your name we pray. Amen.